Would you like to uh, discuss something about the previous lecture, Kigiri conditions? Clear enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah? From the example where you had like the saddle point, and you had um, the inequality constraint that you right. had over the saddle point. Yeah, yeah. And um, why isn't the um, Hessian um, positive? Or the wrong way? Let's uh, let's pull out the slide again, maybe. We can discuss it on the. So we were. That was uh, this one, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah, with the inequality. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So, so for this one, SOSC holds, huh? So everything is fine. And like, I would imagine that like the um, Hessian in this direction would be in that one. Yeah. Yeah, but it's negative definite in that direction. Okay. Oh, oh do you, yeah. you, you you agree with that or yeah? Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. It is. Uh, so this matrix itself. If that function is the Hessian, uh, if there is the Hessian of Lagrange function or the Lagrange function itself, so that function indeed has a negative direction in, um, or that matrix has a negative direction in uh, in that direction here. Um, so what saves the day <laughs> is that uh, the constraint and the way this whole thing is built uh, makes us look only in that direction here, and. Uh, so in case of doubt, you need to write down properly uh, the whole thing. So what happened there was, uh, so again, if you just look at the admissible directions, um, then you're talking about this entire thing here. We agree with that, because you're allowed to move away from the constraint in principle. Uh, but in this SOSC definition, uh, if you have a strictly active <coughs> constraint, so the mu is non-zero, so that's the case here because we're pushing against. Uh, then you restrict your d's to only uh, this, uh, this line here, as if it was an equality constraint, essentially. And that prevents you from looking at this uh, negative direction. Yeah. And that happens a lot. I mean, uh, I've seen, I don't know how many people puzzled with their optimization problem saying, but, but the dehession of my Lagrange function is, uh, has negative directions. How does it even work? It's like, yeah, but you have constraints blocking this direction, so it actually does work. Um, so yeah, you can have cost functions with like defining negative directions and, uh, and so on and so forth. As long as they are blocked by uh, constraints in the right directions, uh, it's all fine. Um, yeah, maybe <laughs> just one uh, stupid comment, it may, maybe it's obvious, maybe not. Uh, this is a local minima, right? Uh, this point here, because I could as well just go over this, uh, this thing here and follow the function all the way down to minus infinity, right? Uh, so in theory, the, the, the true minimum of that problem is actually unbounded. It's minus infinity, because I can move away from that constraint as much as I want, and beyond this saddle point, it's all going down here, right? So if there is no other constraint up here that blocks me, I could do that. Uh, so again, uh, we are always discussing local minima, and we can analyze the uh, conditions there. Okay with that? All right. Oops. So we discussed these um, Kikidi conditions and what they mean and how they may or may not be related to um, having local minima. Um, the second step before really, really start talking about top female control is to understand how you solve them. Uh, so you're given these conditions. Uh, you could write them on the paper for simple problems. Uh, you can actually do that in the exercises. Uh, oh yeah, that's one question. Did you receive the link by uh, Turane? Yeah. So uh, yeah, you have a bunch of exercises on the Kigiri conditions, like small problems, but tailor-made to force you to think <laughs> of uh, what it means uh, 
uh, these KKD conditions all the way to very tiny optimal control problems. Uh, yeah, so the question then is uh, when you write down all these KKD conditions, namely in your computer, you have a big set of equations, what do you do with them? Uh, remember that they are uh, typically nonlinear. Uh, if you have uh, nonlinear constraints, um, and uh, also remember you have this weird uh, complementary stack slackness condition. Remember this uh, mu i h i equals to zero. That's part of the equations you need to solve. And then you even have inequalities. So how do you handle that? Um, and that's uh, the point of. Uh, this lecture and another one as well that I'll give a bit later, I guess, uh, is how you solve uh, these KKD conditions. And uh, the right place to start with is with the Newton method, because at the end of the day, everything is based on that, or everything is a variation of that. Um, so it's very important to understand it. Um, just out of curiosity, who is using the Newton method on a regular basis? Not so many. Who knows about it? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, good. Okay, so as usual, Newton is a very simple thing, uh, but as soon as you uh, move up a bit in, uh, in complexity, you get uh, really funny effects. So as the KKD conditions, it's easy to write it down. It's much less easy to understand all the subtleties. Uh, so if we go back to the big picture, um, <coughs> So I discussed the KKD conditions that will be more or less in that box, essentially, if you have an NLP, how do you turn this problem into a set of algebraic conditions that you can uh, treat to, in order to hopefully get uh, a minimum. Um, the Newton method will be used in here, and what we call SQP is essentially a generalization of the Newton method. Uh, uh, Newton is also used in here, so it's kind of uh, tool that is a bit used all over the place. And roughly speaking, Newton is simply a general purpose sledgehammer to solve algebraic equations. So of course not just using optimization. Uh, most people doing numerics uh, will do either Newton or some simplifications of that. And so in our context, we'll essentially use it for solving these KKD conditions. And we'll have to be careful in a number of places. And I'll try to show you how. But OK, Newton, just in case you don't know what it is, that's essentially the picture. So if you have, let's say, to make it simple, one variable and one equation, R of W. And I'm trying to find the W where this equation is 0, essentially. So I'm just trying to solve that equation. Here it's simple, visually we can see where that is, it's around there. But uh, if you uh, blow up this problem to say dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of dimensions, then it's not really easy to see visually where uh, the zero would be. Um, and what Newton does with this is simply this, you start with a guess of where the solution could be and you may be quite wrong. And at this guess, you will build a linear approximation of your equations. That would be this blue line. And you will solve uh, the equations for this linear approximation instead of the function itself. So here, this line is crossing zero here. And you'll say that, OK, that's going to be my next guess. And then you keep doing that. So essentially, you build a linear approximation of your uh, equations. It will look like this. Instead of solving uh, r w plus delta w is zero, you solve the linear equation as a proxy. And because it's linear, you can easily solve it in uh, how you should move uh, w to solve the equations. And uh, essentially, Newton will want to move here, and then you do the same thing again. And the algorithm of Newton, you could write in a few lines in the computer, really looks like this, you want some exit criterion, you basically say if my equations are solved uh, accurately enough, you want to have some tolerance here, uh, you stop, otherwise you compute uh, R and it's Jacobian here, uh, you solve uh, the linear system, essentially you compute the Newton direction, this delta W, how I should change W, you stop and you do that again. So the Newton method, a simple one, you can code it in a few lines. So if you apply it, uh, that was my new point. 
and you build the model again. You jump over here actually, so you kind of overshooting the solution here, brings you there. So you build this linearization here, and so on and so forth. And uh, typically you'll fairly quickly land uh, in a very, very close neighborhood of the true solution. So when we do that, we are actually doing what we call a full step Newton iteration. Again, that's the kind of keywords you find a lot in the literature, full step. And we'll see what uh, the opposite of that is. Well, actually, that's what it is. Um, uh, reduce steps, that's uh, when you don't take a full step. Uh, that means instead of updating W with the, the full distance Newton is suggesting to travel, you actually uh, move only a fraction of that. So you select a t, that's a scalar between 0 and 1. 1 is a full step, and you may want to not move as fast as that. Uh, why do we want to use reduced steps? So it's trivial to build an example where uh, you would need to do that. Um, here it is. I will step with full steps, so select my t at 1. I start here, build the linear model, and it tells me that I should jump over here. So actually you're jumping over the solution uh, all the way to here. At this point you do it again, linear model, and the linear model brings me back here actually, kind of where I started almost. Um, and I keep going. Actually if you pay a bit of, yeah, if you pay attention you see that you're actually diverging. You're not getting anywhere closer to the solution. You're actually going like kind of oscillating around going further and further, right? So not good. So when you take full steps in Newton, you can be unstable. Uh, easy remedy for that, you just reduce t a little bit, just like I step only 80% of the way, and all of a sudden it converges in three steps, right? So that's uh, what people do most of the time. If you call solvers like IPOP, for example, if you start to understand all this gibberish that the solver is spitting on the screen, part of that you have this. It's telling you, okay, how much did I step uh, in my, uh, my attempts. Okay, so when you do Newton iteration with properly reduced steps, some, sometimes you can take full steps, sometimes not, uh, you'll tend to converge to the point. Um, but does it always converge? Um, that's actually a good question. If I always reduce my step, or let's put it differently, can I always reduce my step uh, adequately so that I, uh, I get closer to my solution, i.e. so that I improve my RW? Now, if you put it a bit more mathematically, you can ask, so can I always find a T between 0 and 1? such that when I take this reduced step, I decrease my R, right? And the answer to that is yes, kind of, <laughs> as usual. Uh, and um, I, we can quickly go through the proof, it's fairly simple. It's also kind of interesting uh, mathematically. So I want to prove that uh, I can find T such that these holes and if you think a little bit, this question, you can turn it into asking, uh, is the derivative of uh, my two norm square of r at t equals zero, is that thing negative? And this essentially means this. Um, Um, I'm sketching here, that will be my norm of Rw plus t delta t. At zero, it would coincide uh, with my, uh, the actual Rw I have. And essentially, if the derivative of that thing here is negative at t zero, that means uh, the slope is going down at t zero. Uh, Maybe further for larger t's, it may be going up again. And then the full step may not be uh, improving on my r. But if the slope is negative here, I need to have somewhere a point that is lower than this one. So I must be improving for 
sum t small enough. Um, and we take the square, <coughs> the square of this to make it differentiable. And then you can just work on a bit of calculus. So this actually turns into that. You can verify this. Um, and then um, you can use this construction. So essentially, uh, we are looking at um, yeah, this derivative built this way. The delta w is given by the Newton step. Uh, we have said essentially from before, and that's uh, the, uh, the Jacobian minus one of uh, r. These things simplify out, and it turns out that uh, the gradient is uh, the uh, r itself. So essentially, you end up with this thing. That's the, the um, derivative of the two norm of this thing here at zero. That's minus uh, the norm square of r i.e., since that thing is positive, this gradient is always zero. So, more of the story is if you are to, at a point w, you eva evaluate delta w. If you follow this da delta w um, a tiny bit, you have to go down on the norm of, uh, of r square. If you go too far along this delta w, you may increase again the r because you're always working with linear models, so they are valid only. Uh, along some distance. Okay, so this can take that offline, it's fairly simple. Uh, but essentially this thing is telling us that uh, if I just keep applying Newton steps and make sure that I uh, step uh, small enough with t small enough such that I improve r, so r is becoming smaller, uh, then it has to work, right? Cannot fail. Or can it? Um, do you see any problem in there that may happen? T approaches zero. Um, yeah. yeah, that would be a problem. There's one thing a tiny bit more striking uh, in what I did here. It has to do with this inverse, actually. When I, I use this, I'm actually making a strong assumption. I'm actually m assuming that my Jacobian is, uh, is invertible. And that is, um, so if, if you use uh, Newton-based solvers, like for example IPOPT, and it crashes in your face, that's what's going on, typically. Okay, let's make a simple example of how it can fail anyway, even though uh, I can always, in theory, improve my uh, uh, R. Uh, here is an example. So the function is this, the solution is here, but then it has this, uh, this curve down there, and I'm gonna deliberately take an initial guess that is uh, at a pretty bad place, so here. And essentially when you linearize at that point, uh, <coughs> it looks like the solution should be over there. So it's giving actually wrong information in some sense. The linear model is not very good at uh, seeing this. Uh, so what will happen is that Newton will basically collapse at this point. And what happens at this point, <coughs> the Jacobian of your function is scalar here, is zero. So when you form the Newton step, given by uh, essentially this, uh, minus one, you're trying to invert something that is zero essentially. So what happens here is that your Newton step ceases to exist. And you can see that geometrically, right? You're basically trying to find the intersection of this blue line with zero. Well, good luck with that. It's basically parallel. Okay? So Newton here in this case, it fails with um, uh, a Newton step that does not exist anymore. So this matrix becomes uh, rank deficient and you cannot compute uh, delta W anymore. Okay with that? Um, yeah, so when solvers exit with, um, you know, no feasible solution found or something like this, that's typically the mode of failure inside <coughs> the numerics, that uh, at some point it was trying to invert a singular uh, linear system. Okay, um, I'll go through a few uh, uh, slightly elaborate things. Um, 
maybe what we can do is because uh, I, I give the proofs in the slides that are not very complex and they, I think they are nice to uh, understand a bit but I'm not sure it's the best place here to <laughs> to uh, walk you through the proofs um, so we can discuss them offline if you're curious about them maybe I'll sh uh, just walk through them very quickly and uh, and rather show you the results um, so here's the question here um, We'll do actually something a little bit funny. So uh, the Newton step is given by by this, or put differently, uh, the next W that you want to try. It's called W plus. That's your W plus delta W. If you take a full step, huh? and that's uh, essentially this. Um, so it will be a R of W minus one R of W, right? <coughs> so it's essentially almost what we do here, but uh, we'll just throw in an extra uh, feature. I will not necessarily use my Jacobian here. I may be using uh, some uh, some other matrix, call it M. Okay, with that. Um, why I want to do that will become obvious a bit later, uh, but uh, to preempt that question, uh, in many cases, evaluating this Jacobian is, uh, can be a bit expensive. It can happen. In which case, uh, you may want to replace it by something that is close enough to it, but not exactly that. Um, an example could be that you may want to do Newton iterations where you evaluate the Jacobian on the inverse uh, once every 10 steps, for example. So you keep it for a while, because maybe if you don't take very large steps, this matrix will not change very much. So you may save in computations by holding this a little while, uh, just changing R, and then you update it whenever needed. That's an example, not the only one. So uh, we often discuss convergence um, using an inexact Jacobian, so some M that will look like the true matrix, but maybe a bit different. Um, okay, that's where uh, the nasty sta stuff start. And essentially, the question will be, uh, when we do these iterations, uh, how fast are we uh, converging to uh, the true solution that I call uh, W star? And in that context, we assume full Newton steps. So there is this caveat that um, uh, it may not necessarily converge. Uh, the proof, maybe I can just show you this aspect. The way you build it typically is by uh, essentially investigating how uh, R of W is compared to R of W star, that's zero, that's the solution you're looking for, uh, in terms of the distance of W to W star. And the way you link these two things is via basically an integration on the path between uh, W star and W. So essentially looking at this segment here and investigating what the function is doing on this path. And that's why you have this integration essentially from W to W star, so the path integral in some sense. And then the machinery behind this is just essentially working on these expressions you do a number of manipulations and then you start bounding things. That's the usual stuff. And um, yeah, essentially you end up with an expression like this that essentially that's an inequality that relates how close the next step, the W plus, will be from the true W star, the one you're looking for, compared to how close you are before. So that's where you start, that's your next step and you relate the distance of the next step to the true solution to the pre previous one you had and you have now these uh, nasty expressions uh, that relate these things. Does it make sense? Yeah. Take that offline if you're interested. Um, if one day you need to investigate the convergence around these kind of methods, it's, it can be very useful to understand these things. Um, otherwise you can probably trust it. What happens then is you will basically try to put bounds on these things here. Essentially try to uh, explicitly <coughs> state how small they are supposed to be. 
and um, they look awful, but they're actually not that uh, complicated in the end. What is happening, for example, in this term? Um, you would see that uh, you have essentially m minus the true Jacobian, right? And obviously, if you were using the true Jacobian in here, in here, this thing would be zero, right? So this thing is essentially kind of telling us something about the price we pay in convergence if we're not using the correct thing, right? If, if this thing is uh, non-zero, then you have this bound on how close you get to the solution of the next step. You'll have a contribution from this part. And the second thing, uh, it's a bit nastier, uh, but it has to do with comparing uh, the Jacobian of my, oh yeah, the Jacobian of my function R to the one I have at W. So essentially, this thing here is essentially assessing how the Jacobian of R is changing along this path from W to W plus. If it's not changing much, then the function is kind of close to linear and that will be easy to converge. So the linear model in Newton will be good. If uh, this R is changing a lot, then uh, you will have problems or it will be less easy. So I um, can imagine something like in, the, in 1D and that's your R and uh, if you have something like this, you take your linear model here and that's your W star. This kind of term will essentially look at how your Jacobian, so that slope here, how is it changing along the, along the way and it's changing a lot, it's bad news. So this term would tend to be large. But if it's not changing at all, for example, if R is linear, then the Jacobian is never changing. And essentially, these two terms will simplify out and that will be zero. So this guy is small if uh, you use some th the matrix M that is close to the true Jacobian. And this one is small if the Jacobian is not changing much between W and W star. So actually, that's what these uh, equations are saying. And from this, actually, it's a few lines of mathematics, so it's pretty straightforward in some sense. And from that, you can actually write a convergence um, statement about Newton. Uh, you need a few things that are really just related to bounding these terms. Um, <coughs> the first one is essentially really saying that how close is, uh, no, sorry, that's uh, how much is the Jacobian changing on the way from W to W star. If you can put some uh, Lipschitz condition on that, so these guys will not differ more than something times how far W is from W star. That's one way of bounding it. Uh, the second one is bounding on how wrong you are with the matrix M when you take a Newton iteration. Uh, in case M is changing over time, you want to call it an MK. You can pin some uh, constant kappa here on it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then you also need your initial guess to be decently good. So the first W you throw inside your Newton iteration, you want to be t it to be close enough to W star, <coughs> close enough being given by this constant. If you have these conditions, then uh, essentially what happens is that um, the next iteration in Newton, your W plus if you want, the way it relates to your W, being close to W star is via this constant here. So you have a forced decrease as long as this thing here is, uh, is uh, not more than one uh, and that's guaranteed by this condition here. Uh, then you converge along these lines. So that's the end of the proof how you use these terms in uh, the equations before. You look at that offline. <coughs> Maybe I want to make a very small unpacking of this last condition, <coughs> this thing here. Because you actually see uh, two contributions here, coming from the kappa and coming from that term here. Um, so what is uh, going on here? You can uh, think for a second that um, I choose my mk as being the Jacobian itself. 
so let's say I use the exact matrix in my Newton iterations, in which case this term here is zero. So I can select kappa k is zero all the way, right? In which case uh, I can forget this term here, right? If I can do that, then my uh, convergence thingy here is actually uh, simplifying to um, this stuff here, like this omega over 2 times uh, w minus w star square, because I have this and that, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it's actually fairly easy to make uh, an example. Uh, just imagine for a second that um, your one half omega is one, and let's imagine that uh, you have that this guy is maybe ten to the minus one, right? That's how close you start with your w. Then, according to this inequality, uh, the next one. When you step, would be 10 to the minus 2, right? You squared it. And then you apply Newton again using W plus as your next um, guess. The W plus plus is 10 to the minus 4, right? And so on and so forth. So you're basically going this way 10 to the minus 8, 16, and so on. Okay? So that's essentially what this inequality is telling us for kappa is zero. And just to be clear, this kind of convergence, essentially at each iteration, you double the number of accurate digits, is very strong. It's called a quality convergence. Uh, you can hardly get something stronger than this. And when we had the examples of Newton working properly with full steps, you saw that it was like kind of nailing the solution very quickly. That's a byproduct of this time, type of convergence. So Newton is, a, is, a, is, is a, has an extremely strong convergence. If you don't use an exact matrix, then things are not as nice. This term here comes in, and then uh, if you forget this term for a second, you just have a linear convergence. So that will be more something like uh, maybe uh, 0.8. 10 to the minus 1, O64, 10 to the minus 1, and so, so on and so forth. So it's much, much slower. But it may still be valuable to, uh, to approximate this matrix. Any question with that? All right. No problem. Did you know about this convergence stuff before? Or not really. Hmm. Uh, there are many things that can get on the way of, uh, or in the way of, uh, of getting this, uh, this strong convergence, like approximate uh, matrices, inaccurate linear algebra, and so on and so forth. But, uh, um, yeah. Um, maybe one interesting remark. Um, can uh, maybe write a few things here again. So, that's a very practical question, actually. Um, you see that happening a lot in practice, like people have a uh, um, set of equations they want to solve with Newton. Maybe it's, it's very large scale, possibly. And um, it doesn't work so well. And they suspect that one of the issues is that some of their variables are very large and some are very small, right? Like the scaling in the equations is not that nice. And then they consider rescaling their equations or their variables. Like say, change the units in the variables uh, and hope it will help. So essentially what they are saying is that um, they will kind of redefine their variables and scale them in the equations so that, uh, and hope that they will uh, the solving that instead will help. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad idea to do that, but Newton is not sensitive to these changes. If you rescale uh, the problem, Newton is not affected in theory. Um, so that's what I'm trying to explain here. Um, so if you imagine that you reparameterize your W with, uh, for example, 
a matrix times V plus some shift, for example, uh, and you use a non-zero transformation. Um, then, um, and that you def define a new set of equations based on V instead of W, so essentially just introducing A, V plus A in there. Uh, and then you try to do Newton on, uh, on these new equations. So what's going to happen, you can make the calculations. Uh, the transformation will change your Jacobian by A transpose here. And uh, your Newton step on this new system is given by this. And if you use this in here, you will realize that you're essentially doing uh, this transformation. You can again take that offline. But long story short, uh, the step that you get in delta v by working on, on the new equations is actually simply this linear transformation on the step you would take on the original equations. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, you did not really transform your equations. Uh, you may take different steps, uh, but uh, the Newton iteration will behave exactly the same essentially. Essentially just because the, the steps you take are simply linearly related. So some, to summarize this, the, the scaling in your equations does not, will not change the behavior of the Newton method. You can apply your Newton methods on the original equations or transform them, run them side by side, they will take the exact same number of steps in principle. If you use inexact Newton methods, then you may affect it. Uh, that's only true for, uh, for exact Newton methods. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a bit of um, uh, an argument for not trying to scale things uh, in your problem. But I don't mean to say you should not uh, necessarily do that. Uh, the reason is when you rescale the equations, you may make um, your Jacobian here better conditioned. It's, it's purely numerical. Uh, if, uh, if your variables, for example, in a problem, you have some in the range of 10 to the 10 and some in the range 10 to the minus 10, it is challenging for the computer in the linear algebra down here at this level. So when it's trying to solve this system, um, it's not good news. So in, in that context, it's a good idea to rescale. But if you rescale the problem, be aware that the only thing you hope to gain is a better linear algebra. You will not change the Newton iterations. Uh, this observation has another interesting consequence because the stuff I showed you before on the convergence, it was actually not scale invariance. Uh, if I'm changing my variables inside the problem, um, the, this uh, coefficients that will bound uh, the W plus to W star, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they will be affected by this rescaling, uh, which means that this proof is, uh, is maybe not the best way of analyzing uh, the Newton convergence. Uh, and that's the reason why people develop some uh, sharper tools like self-concordance theory, uh, mostly using convex optimization uh, to, um, to get the scale invariant uh, convergence description. Yeah, that's what I said before. I, rescaling will not change Newton, but it can still be useful for improving the linear algebra in your uh, equations. Okay, um, I guess we should stop here and I we restart at 1.15. Uh, the schedule on back course is 2.15, I oh, think. Oh, 2.15? Yeah. Yeah, okay, 2.15. Two two yeah. It's fine for me. Yeah, so next step, we'll uh, apply Newton on the Kigli conditions and discuss that, yeah?